This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Today, we're talking about the economics and theory behind interest rates. Where do they come from? What's their function? And most importantly, what is the correct theory to help us understand interest rates and why they exist? It turns out the classical and neoclassicals didn't particularly understand this. The Marxists were wrong. The Keynesians were wrong. And it took a French economist named Turgot and later on some of the great Austrians like Bamberwerk and Mises to really explain why interest rates exist and what their function is. And here to help us discuss this is, again, the great Dr. Jeff Herbner from Grove City College. Well, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, thanks so much for joining us again on the Human Action Podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's a real pleasure. Boy, you know, you talk about interest rates. It seems like this dry subject. I'm not sure most people or even most economists even think that there's a theory to any of this. Interest rates are just some sort of I guess public policy tool, or just, or just a mechanical item for bankers to apply somehow. I, I mean, interest rate theory. Do, do people think about this? Uh, no, as you say, uh, not not too uh, carefully. I would say they uh, they may have some kind of notions in the back of their head about it, but uh, not very well thought out most of the time. Well, let's start chronologically. Let's start early. Uh, help us walk through some of the early conceptions or ideas of what interest is. Uh, of course, it's always tied to capital. Capital and interest are sort of two sides uh, of a topic. But since capital theory is such a huge thing unto itself, I want to sort of stick to interest rates today. Um, so, so, I mean, give us a sense of, of Adam Smith, for example, for the, the early classical idea of interest rates. All right. And we can even... Uh... Well, we could start there and uh, mention also Turgot in this uh, context. Yeah, so, right. So Turgot is maybe uh, a, a bit before Adam Smith chronologically. Right. And, and Turgot, uh, interestingly, um, was uh, proto-Austrian on this. Uh, Rothbard has a really great section in his History of Thought on Turgot on uh, subjective value and pricing and uh, also interest in capitalization. And so Turgot recognized that... Um, interest arises from a fundamental uh, discount uh, of the future relative to the present. So he was uh, aware of what we today would call a time preference, although he didn't think about it quite in the same way that uh, Mises and Fetter would. But he recognized that uh, when uh, resources, durable resources are purchased in a market by an, an entrepreneur, that the payment um, uh, for the future revenue generated by these resources like land and capital goods and uh, so on uh, would be discounted. And therefore, the, the uh, entrepreneur who has invested uh, capital funding up front in a production process would earn this uh, rate of interest across time, no matter what uh, product uh, was being produced and no matter how the uh, original present money was being invested. So he was very, he was very good, uh, very pioneering. Uh, in this respect. Well, for our listeners who aren't familiar with Turgot, uh, we have a great article by Rothbard, which we'll link to for the show. And and Jeff, he's writing in the mid-1700s. So we're talking about 100 years, for example, before Bamberwerk, who we'll get to. And in reading Murray's article about him, I was struck by this this uh, sense, and it still applies to the to the arguments we're having today about labor and capital. Left libertarians talk about wages as theft. A Alexandria Ocasio Cortez talks about exploitation, but but Rothbard says, well, it, it, you know, the interest represents a payment by labor to capitalists for advancing their wages. In other words, the capitalist has to wait to hopefully make a profit and also risk. But whereas the, the wage earner is getting paid here and now in advance of, let's say, the sale of the actual good or service. Yeah, exactly. And, and Turgot, uh, Turgot actually integrated both those features, the, both the um, abstinence, the waiting part, so to speak, and the, and the uncertainty. He, he, uh, he actually saw that both of these would be a component of this uh, discount, uh, this price spread between uh, paying money up front to buy inputs and then uh, producing something and selling the output for money in the future. Well, so also writing in the 1700s, Adam Smith, what I think of what I guess the classical conception of interest is some sort of return on capital. So it's it's more amorphous and it doesn't go directly to time. 
Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, you know, in uh, Boom Bavrik's uh, treatment of the um, uh, views on interest uh, before he wrote, he, he showed that uh, these British classical economists had a wide variety of uh, particular ways in which they tried to explain interest. But as Boom Bavrik points out, they were all tied to the labor theory of value. And, and therefore, they, they were always attempting, uh, Smith and Ricardo and, um, and so on, always attempting to make a room for interest uh, within a labor theory of value where the assumption is that uh, the final uh, revenue of the, of the uh, product produced is reducible down to uh, payments for labor. And this becomes, as you can imagine, this, this doesn't seem to leave uh, any room for uh, interest at all. And, uh, and so it, uh, it always had to be something like a, what the Boom Barber called use uh, theories of uh, resources, that there was somehow a separable uh, use uh, value that was tied to labor uh, that was used then to engage in production by combining capital and labor together. Right. And and as uh, pointed out in Roger Garrison's article about Bob Berbrick, who we'll get into a little bit here, uh, we'll also link to that. He, in, in his first volume of his three-volume treatise, and these three volumes together represent what, what Joe Salerno, anyway, considers one of the big four books in Austrian economics. So the first volume is called uh, uh, History and Critique of Interest Theories, which, as Jeff Herbner just mentioned, uh, discusses some of the ideas in the past. The second one is maybe the most famous uh, and the most applicable to our conversation today, The Theory of Capital. And the third is called Further Essays on Capital and Interest. And all of these are written uh, basically in the 1880s. Uh, but in, in that first one where he's criticizing some of these, you know, he really, he really helps us, uh, I guess, better understand all the, the thoughts that had come until then. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out, Jeff, is he never read. He, he died just after Mises' uh, Theory of Money and Credit came out. And in correspondence, appears to have not read that, and thus uh, was never influenced by it. Uh, right. So Mises himself writes that um, uh, when his book uh, Theory, Money, and Credit came out in 1912, that uh, Bumbav work uh, spent some time in his private seminar uh, discussing the work. But as Mises uh, chronicles that discussion, uh, Bumbav work was really not accepting of. Mises's approach to money and um, you know what he was uh, what he was trying to get at. He seemed somewhat uncomprehending of the whole structure of the book and uh, what Mises was trying to do. Yeah, and of course Mises uh, criticizes or not criticizes distinguishes himself from Bob Berwick uh, a little later, or actually decades later in, in Human Action. But let let's get a little further into what what the gist of Bob Berwick's second volume, his Capital and Interest, the second volume, is all about. I mean, first and foremost, he brings us back again to this idea again and again to this idea of time that there's a difference in value between present and future goods and and you know the two of us talking that sounds so easy and obvious but you know in the 1880s maybe that wasn't so obvious to everyone maybe you we, you and I benefit from hindsight here well absolutely we do and um and it's to our great benefit, uh, of course, to be able to have, uh, read and absorb uh, Bumbabur's work. He, of course, was um, a very complicated writer on uh, in pioneering his own uh, theory of interest, uh, because as uh, as Rothbard and others have pointed out, he even though he stressed time preference, he he has a more um, objective component of what determines time preference than we would think of or that was uh, filtered out uh, really by Mises and uh, Frank Fetter. He seems to think that uh, and argues that time preference itself is uh, there's a law that influences the rate of time preference itself that's determined in turn by the technical considerations of production. And so Bumbabrik himself sort of in, reintroduced into his own theory after uh, showing that other theories uh, based on productivity were no good an element of productivity. And so it has the, it seems like the temporal element has at least been alluded to in earlier work. Obviously, Turgot understood it, but it, it, did, did the classicals understand interest as, as this idea of, 
of discounting things in the future? Or, I mean, was a temporal element there for for work before Bombarvark other than Turgot? Uh, it was. So uh, Bombarvark points out that uh, Senior um, had what uh, Bombarvark called an abstinence theory of uh, interest, <clears throat> which uh, then involved a you know waiting or a time element. Uh, and uh, the criticism that Bumbabrik made of this, although he pointed out that that is somewhat uh, better than the other classical British classical economists, <clears throat> was that this would explain only the supply of uh, 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 loanable funds and uh, wouldn't explain the demand. Why would people pay just because the supplier of loanable funds insists on a payment mm -hmm. in order to abstain from uh, present consumption. Right. They're only giving something up because somebody else wants what they're giving up. Yeah, exactly. In, in effect. Um, I want to get further into Bomberwerk here, but should we, is this a good time to mention Vixel, Newt Vixel? They call him, I guess, the Swedish Austrian, which is kind of funny, but he was a Swede and he's working at somewhat the same time uh, as Bomberwerk. And, and he, he used the, pr the phrase, for example, the natural rate of interest. So, so what, is, what should we know about Vixel on interest? Yeah, it's not so much uh, Vixel's um, theory of interest. What was important in his work for the Austrian uh, school was his view that there is a kind of natural rate of interest that emerges on the market that is uh, determined in, in the particular way that he thinks that can vary from the bank loan rate. And what what was important about uh, Vixel was that he showed that if, if the bank loan rate is artificially lowered below the uh, natural rate, <clears throat> this will lead to the beginning of a boom bust uh, cycle. And so it wasn't so much uh, Vixel's uh, theory of interest that was important to uh, the Austrians, the Mises who came later, but this theory of the dynamic of what would happen when bank rates were lowered below uh, this natural rate. Well, let me ask you this. I'm not saying this facetiously. Do you think Jerome Powell knows who Vixel was? Do you think, <laughs> do you think a 20-something a uh, uh, newly minted PhD, brilliant Ivy League PhD, the Fed knows who Vixel was? Uh, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> probably not, but, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be, uh, someone uh, who would be, uh, you know, studied, uh, vigorously by uh, newly minted PhD. Right. It, it, you know, I, I'm joking, but it's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I, I mean, I would like to know the answer to that. You know, it's, it's, it's That's funny right. to me to think about the idea that people were thinking and saying brilliant things 150 years ago, and maybe we ought to read them or give them some credence. Uh, yeah, it's just just like Rothbard uh, always pointed out about uh, how knowledge can be lost. Uh, it's not a Whig theory of history that we just progress uh, further and further into the light, but uh, sometimes we lose knowledge. Right, right. And we, we imagine that society goes forward only and never sideways or even backwards. Um, and I think that applies to knowledge also. Let, let me ask you this. What is, what is Vixel, what's the point he talks about having a stable price level and that the natural rate of interest will give us that? Is, is that, I mean, a stable price level sounds like a good thing, but is it, is it a good thing that we ought to seek? Uh, well, in his system, it, it's the natural result. I'm, I'm not sure if it's good or bad per okay. se. Uh, what, what Excel was trying to do was simply to explain the causes behind price inflation and the causes behind price deflation. And within his system, uh, he thought about this with respect to the quantity theory of money. But within his system, this was the mechanism by which um, price inflation would be set in motion, that uh, without this distortion of the bank rate uh, below the natural rate, if the natural rate were just persisting in the market, and left alone, then we would have stable uh, array of prices. But if the bank rate were lowered, uh, then you would have arbitrage. Entrepreneurs begin to borrow at the bank rate, uh, low rate of interest, and arbitrage those funds into production. And by in order to do that, they would have to uh, buy more resources, and they begin to bid up the prices of resources, and we'd see this period of price inflation hmm. and expansion of production and so on. Hmm, that, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, that sounds like proto malinvestment. 
Yeah, that, uh, well, again, I, I'm not sure Wixell himself saw it that way, but you're right, in the hands of, uh, 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 well, uh, Mises, who accepted Bumbabrick's uh, capital structure theory, um, you could see right away how the application of this uh, dynamic would uh, distort intertemporal allocation of resources. So so getting back to Babervik, people who haven't read this, it, it really, first of all, I'm intrigued by how people in the 1800s were writing. It tends to be zestier. Uh, he has a lot of exclamation points. He has a lot of cool words like Pike Staff and things like that. And it's just, it, obviously, this is a, a translation from his original German. The one I'm reading happens to be by Hans Senholz. But nonetheless, he gives us some some causes of interest or some reasons why interest would arise and why it exists. And they're so interesting to me because they're not dry or technical. They're actually sort of full of life and zesty. In other words, one of the causes, for example, I'll give you Jeff, is he talks about the brevity and uncertainty of human life. And we don't think about that when it comes to banking, but that's – but that's uh, that's part of of what we're talking about here is that either you know we could die. Uh, tomorrow is not certain, and it, it, so interest has almost a philosophical or, or metaphysical element. Yeah, that's exactly right. And when when Bumbabrik mentions that, he's more in line with what uh, Mises would uh, take as the uh, notion of time preference that it's simply bound up in the human condition of us being finite and temporal beings. It, it must be the case because we're temporal that we distinguish between sooner and later and that we always prefer sooner satisfaction of an end to later. Now, Bumbabrik wouldn't, wouldn't formulate it this way, but, uh, but that's the statement where he's getting closest to what, uh, what uh, Mises would uh, formulate uh, later. I should add on your point about the liveliness of Bumbabrik, he he also is very he's he's very interesting in the way that he uh, argues by analogy. You may have picked up on this too when you read through. He, he'll he'll state an argument kind of dryly from some author long ago, and then he'll say, you know, this is analogous to this particular uh, case, and then he'll give us a really interesting uh, modern case, modern for him. Yeah, it, and just the level of writing. I think in part it's because economics was not thought of as such a standalone discipline at the time. So as a result, I think the, the, the writers in the 1800s brought in a lot more history and, and philosophy and, and other sciences. Um, you know, when, when you talk about the temporal element, and, and I think all of our listeners would agree that humans are temporal beings and that uh, th this is sort of an a priori uh, truth about humans that we always prefer present consumption to future. And I, I think the example we might give of that is uh, at least in our current uh, – with our current uh, life expectancies, everyone would rather have their dream house at 40 than 90, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. But, but I wonder – you know, I was just thinking about this over the weekend. I wonder if people would challenge that today and say, well, you know, just like people are saying that the AI revolution is going to render Hayek and Mises' arguments about information obsolete. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, but, you know, well, you know, we can't know that you'll always prefer present consumption of future. What if, what if we uh, – what if life extension makes us live 200 years? What if, what if X? What if Y? I mean, is that – you know, what do you think of that, the, the idea that we uh, – uh, of time preference and that we always prefer something sooner than later, get, get all other things being equal? Right. Again, uh, I, I'm a complete necessity on this. It, I think that um, it's the same or analogous to uh, the existence of our being finite, which implies then the scarcity of the means that we can apply to the attainment of ends. Once we recognize that means are scarce with respect to the attainment of our ends, it follows just as a matter of uh, logical deduction that we would always prefer more of a good to less of it as long mm -hmm. as the, this good remains scarce uh, because we're finite. And Mises argues the same way then about our temporal existence. Since we exist in time, we, we recognize right away the difference between sooner and later. Once we recognize the difference between sooner and later because of the passage of time, we always prefer, now he specifies, a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to the same satisfaction later. Uh, so it's a it's a Sater's Paribus claim that he makes. He's very careful in the way that he mm. uh, words this to ward off uh, objections of the sort that you're uh, talking about. Well, I guess when we solve scarcity and uh, mortality, 
via technology, we can drop all this Austrian economics business. Yeah, we'll but, just live uh, forever, forever <laughs> at the bliss point, right? Yeah. But, and, you know, another point that Bomberwick makes that I really enjoy is that he says, and I'm quoting him, nothing in the nature of interest could make it unfair or unjust in itself. So he's, you know, there are worldviews. Uh, there are left-wing worldviews. There are, you know, in the Islamic world, there are different ideas about whether interest is is ethical or moral. Uh, and he's making the case that that it, it ar- because it arises naturally. There's nothing about interest per se, contra the Marxist, that's exploitative. Yeah, that's right. And uh, again, he, um, he he notices this, and Rothbard emphasizes this, but Bumbabrik even notices this uh, about Turgot. That Turgot was a great um, opponent of uh, anti-usury laws uh, of the Middle Ages, and he made he made precisely this point—a very realistic um, analysis where he said, "Look, it's just in the nature of uh, human existence that uh, if, if people are going to lend and borrow at a positive rate of interest, and if you outlaw this, it won't uh, eliminate it; it'll just uh, drive it into other channels that are less efficient." Yeah, and there, I think there's some parallels here to uh, philosophy, to sociology, even to ethics, where we say that generally speaking, things that comport with human nature uh, are, are good, and things that are at odds with human nature are bad. I, I mean, we're getting into uh, that. That's why I love reading old Austrian stuff, is because it's not dry. It actually it, it makes you think about uh, life in the broader sense. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, Guido Holtzman has this great. Uh introduction to uh, Mises' uh, epistemological problems where he makes this point about the early Austrians really thinking of themselves more broadly than just as economists in the narrow sense, but as uh, sociologists, if you will, or commentators on a broader social nexus. Yeah. And so in in developing what we now would call a time preference theory of interest, um, he you know, Bomberg wasn't using that term per se. Uh, you know, fast forward uh, 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 to uh, like, for instance, Frank Knight. Uh, when we talked about uh, Menger's principles, Frank Knight had written uh, m- many years later, in about 1950, had written an introduction to that book where he criticizes this outright time preference theory of interest. And, and I'm quoting Frank Knight from that introduction. He seems, well, it seems untenable in the absence of any reason to believe in the underlying psychological uh, assumptions. And so this is getting into something that Bob Berwick had not yet gotten into because Mises had developed praxeology and, and uh, the, the things that come that, that precede praxeology, which we call timology. Um, so, so talk about uh, the underlying psychological assumptions, which here Frank Knight is dismissing that, that, that undergird all of this. Right. So uh, the way I would uh, think about this is that Knight seems to, uh, with respect to interest, he seems to think that this is just um, a, a phenomena of production itself. In other words, when he thinks of interest, what he's trying to uh, conceptualize is simply the greater physical productivity of uh, capital intensive production processes. And so the, the, he, he bypasses the very uh, fundamental notion, really, even of human action in the sense of uh, the way that uh, Mises thinks about it as the uh, relationship between the human mind that's evaluating and choosing and so on, and these objective features of the world. Knight you know, wants to criticize this uh, more robust uh, analysis that, that, that Mises introduces uh, by, by just looking at one element of uh, human action, which is this objective, technical, physical a set of production possibilities. And presumably Frank Knight had read Bomberwerk, would you imagine? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, but it, but again, the first volume of, of Bomberwerk's three-volume treatise is all about uh, debunking use theories, productivity theories, absence theories, etc. Uh, so it, it sounds like you are, uh, are, are uh, applying to Frank Knight sort of a, a productivity theory of interest. Yeah, that seems well. This is what he uh, wrote uh, in response to to the Austrian okay to this uh, time preference, you know, uh, view. He you know, wrote about uh, Crusonia plants and so on that generate uh, just by natural growth um, uh, an increase in their size or fruit or whatever over time. 
and that this proves, uh, you know, uh, definitively that there's a, uh, if you own the plant, you earn this stream of uh, physical uh, return. And, and that's all we need to explain. Whereas, Bumba, as Bumbaber pointed out, that's not what we're trying to explain with interest. What we're trying to explain with interest is the intertemporal price of money. We're trying to explain the, the, the phenomenon of the market, which is brought about by human choice and action and, uh, and not by just mere technical features. Before we move, let's say, farther ahead into Mises on interest, um, let's get out of the 1800s into the early 1900s. Uh, you know, Keynes had this idea of uh, liquidity preference theory that uh, you know we we like things that can be more more quickly or readily converted into currency, and and to the extent they can be, they'll command a lower rate of interest. Whereas things are, that are less liquid uh, and thus bear some more uncertainty or, or, or a longer period of time will, will command a higher in, a rate of interest. So this this for, first of all. I, I assume that from your perspective, this is wrong. And second of all, it, nonetheless, we keep coming back to this element of time, which other schools seem to, if not grudgingly accept, at least weave into their own ideas. Yeah, so Keynes, uh, Keynes took the other sort of extreme position um, as opposed to productivity theories. He, his view is often characterized as a purely monetary theory of interest. So he thinks the interest rate uh, is determined by the demand uh, for money, as you say, the liquidity preference, uh, given the stock of money that exists in society. <clears throat> and well, one might think, well, how is that possible? Wh why would simply holding money generate interest? And so here what he says is that uh, it's an opportunity cost. So uh, the person who holds money forgoes earning interest on bonds. And therefore, uh, the interest then influences the uh, the holding of money. There'd be a downward sloping demand for holding money relative uh, to interest. <clears throat> and of course, as Boom Barber already pointed out, this this way of reasoning, he, he pointed this out in criticizing other interest theories uh, before Keynes, obviously. Th this uh, method of reasoning from explaining the price of something as an opportunity cost, it, it doesn't work. This is logically inadequate. You can't explain the, you know, the price of the product of something by by its opportunity cost alone, as we've already uh, mentioned. Uh, you have to explain it by the demand for the thing and not just the opportunity given up by the person supplying it. The other aspect of Keynes' theory, of course, is what he calls the marginal efficiency of investment. So Keynes thought that give each uh, investable project in the economy um, you, the investor could calculate the uh, rate of return on this investment and then invest in the higher rate of return uh, projects, you know, out to the, uh, uh, the, the, the loan rate at which you could borrow money. But this, too, is uh, completely overturned. This view is completely overturned by uh, Fetter and, and really implicitly by Turgot, who pointed out that the rate of return on an investment depends upon the price you pay for the resources that you buy in order to engage in the project. And the price that you're willing to pay for the resources that an entrepreneur or investor is willing to pay for the resources uh, is the capitalized value of the future revenue stream. And the capitalized value is determined by the rate of interest itself. So once again, this is just logically untenable to uh, reason the way that Keynes did. But what we think of as a Keynesian today, and of course, a lot of views, a lot of neo-Keynesianism, whatever you want to call it, a lot of views ascribed to Keynes are not, not necessarily actually held by him. Um, I'm someone who has, has read nothing by Keynes other than the general theory. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me if, 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 you're, uh, if your sole MO is to stimulate demand in an economy and that you believe consumption equals prosperity, which seems to be what we believe today. Then, then it high interest rates are bad, <laughs> right? We want, <laughs> yeah. we want, we want people buying and consuming, not saving. Yes, yes, that 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 is the whole um, the whole thrust uh, behind uh, the the Keynesian framework, and by implication, the the framework of most uh, modern macro economists who who accept the aggregate demand, aggregate supply kind of framework. Now we haven't really touched on Marx here. I'm going to paraphrase. Marx and his progeny, I assume, would say something along the lines of, 
interest is inherently exploitative because all value comes from workers. And so anything that they're not paid that doesn't go to them, but goes to some sort of owner in the form of interest is, is taken from them. Is that roughly correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. And then, of course, it was uh, Boom Bob work who, uh, who exploded this view uh, in, his, in his great work on this, uh, pointing out uh, the, the actual two components that, uh, that Turgot uh, noticed in uh, in the price spread between prices of output and prices of inputs paid uh, by an entrepreneur. When an entrepreneur uh, buys inputs and pays wages to labor, uh, the uh, there's a discount in the um, in the payment from the marginal revenue product that the uh, worker would earn. If the worker w- were willing to wait until the output was sold, then the worker could earn the full marginal revenue product. But the uh, price spread exists because the entrepreneur pays in advance of the sale of the uh, outputs and the generation of the revenue. And then the other is, of course, uncertainty, that someone has to bear the uncertainty of uh, the final product not being sold for what is anticipated and built into the payment to uh, labor and wages. And uh, this is uh, undertaken by the entrepreneur and the workers relieved of this uh, bearing of uncertainty because the worker, again, is paid in advance a, a contractual wage. Well, and and Bomberva goes into this. So give us give us your thoughts. What would be the role of interest, uh, if any, in a in a pure socialist or pure planned economy? Well, uh, as as Mises points out in uh, in Human Action, um, origin what he calls originary interest, time preference, and originary interest exists regardless of the uh, institutional setting. Uh, they, it exists in the Caruso economy, it exists in the socialist economy, it exists in the market economy, and so on. <clears throat> it's just that only in the market economy, well, the Caruso economy is a, a separable case, but in the division of labor economy, it's only in the market economy that it can be efficiently uh, integrated into decision making. So the socialist uh, centrally planned uh, attempt at uh, arranging a division of labor uh, would again face uh, the, the the same kind of uh, economic calculation problem. They wouldn't have mm. a market uh, interest rate in uh, denominated in money by which they could integrate uh, their present value calculations uh, of uh, you know investable projects to determine where the greatest capital value investable projects are. Yeah, it's interesting how e- even the even the most planned economies always come back to these signposts. And these signals and, and and that grasping in the dark doesn't actually work so well. Uh, so I want to talk about this section in human action, and and I think for today's discussion anyway, I like I, I like his discussion of interest in human action perhaps m- more than in the theory of money and credit because it, it represents a, a view later in his life and maybe a more developed view. Um, so this term you've already used it, originary interest, and and you know I fall into this trap too of, of saying well interest rates are prices uh, that you know supply and demand of money, and he reminds us that that the price is just the ultimate reflection of interest rates. In other words, originary interest he defines as a ratio and not a price, and that ratio is more or less between the value of of our want satisfactions now and uh, the value of our want satisfactions later. So help help us understand this term originary interest. Yeah, th- this again is a little bit tricky, and uh, you have to read Mises very carefully. It's a very technical area in economics. So <clears throat> Mises defines, at least the way I read him, he defines time preference as a satisfaction difference. So time preference, again, is the um, uh, the desire that people have, the preference people have for a sooner satisfaction as opposed to the same satisfaction later. Now, you can't put satisfactions in a ratio. You can only mm. rank order them. And so this doesn't give us uh, an interest rate or a, a ratio. To have a ratio, we have to uh, the um, time preference has to be manifest in some act uh, using goods. And what's fundamental about this act is what Mises calls originary interest. This is the ratio of present uh, goods to future goods. Well, the the, the um, premium that present goods command over future goods, as he puts it, of like kind and qu- and quantity. <clears throat> now, the the other complicating factor, of course, is that the only actual manifestation of originary interest is in money and not in actual goods uh, th- that are being bought uh, with money and then sold for money. 
So uh, an entrepreneur borrows money or self-finances uh, production to buy a collection of uh, inputs and then transforms these inputs into uh, other goods, output, and then sells the output for money. Mm-hmm. And the interest uh, on the market that the entrepreneur earns is in the form of money, even though the entrepreneur is fundamentally taking uh, 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 this collection of goods and transforming it and then producing something of greater value uh, in the future in terms of the output. But this this ratio, let's say, of, of want satisfaction now, want satisfaction later, I mean, ultimately, it apart from governments and central banks, and that's a big apart, uh, uh, ultimately, it manifests itself in a number, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. at some point, it's... It, it, it deter, you know the supply and demand determines a price, and you and I you bu- you loan me a thousand bucks, and we come up with an interest rate. That's correct, and this is precisely why you can't conceive of um, of this uh, ratio uh, or this price, however you want to say it. You can't conceive of this in goods themselves, because again, you couldn't form a ratio between, uh, or at least not a single ratio, at least. Between, uh, you know, all the different collections of uh, producer goods that are used, hours of labor and numbers of machines and acres of land and so on and so forth, uh, against the uh, output that's produced, let's say, number of uh, refrigerators that are produced in a production process. You can only form this ratio in a common unit, and the common unit is money. So once again, we see the importance of economic calculation to Mises, that all of the different elements of uh, pricing are not in kind and barter exchange ratios, but they're all including the interest rate in money. Now, let's go back to our example of no no central bank and no state intervention. What what if you know it's 150 years ago and you're in a small town uh, without access? Neither you nor your small town bank has access to big national or international capital markets. Would would my ability to borrow money literally be dependent on my neighbor's willingness to save and deposit? And would the interest rate reflect that? I, I mean, it seems like all of this at one point in time was hyper-localized. Yeah, it's possible. I, I, I am not sure about historical uh, analysis of cases like this, but certainly across regions, uh, you, you can see this kind of thing. Um, the, the thing that uh, tends to, though, overcome this uh, regionalization of uh, credit markets is precisely that this trade is all done in money. And uh, very quickly in history, then it, it could be done in claims to money. And once that step is taken, say, uh, in the high Middle Ages by the uh, by the banking institutions of northern Italian city states, uh, you, you tend to see a more uh, uh, widespread geographic area sort of encompassed into a single uh, financial market area. Right. So in other words, the market trends this way. It takes care of it. Exactly. It expands and uh, and develops through financial innovation this way. So Mises talks about a neutral interest rate. Now, he, he you know, we've heard him say many times, money's never neutral. M- money never hits everybody at the same time and benefits everyone at the same time. So, but, but what's, what's a, n- a neutral rate of interest in the Misesian sense? And what does, wh- what does it mean to us? How does it help us understand things? I think here Mises is trying to integrate now uh, Luxell's uh, notion of the natural rate. The, the problem with the with the way Luxell formulates this is that he did it in, in terms of the goods themselves. And so once again, it isn't possible for Mises to integrate a barter exchange ratio analysis into his monetary economic calculation analysis. So and of course, there are additional theoretical implications uh, that Wicksell didn't uh, develop that Mises does in his business cycle theory. So to talk about a neutral rate of interest, he's, he's speaking about the rate that would emerge on the market uh, through just the voluntary saving and investing of uh, people based upon their time preferences and you know other, other factors involved in lending and borrowing. And then, then again, uh, he, he invokes the kind of dynamic that Wixell talked about. What if the government steps in and manipulates the market rate and it deviates, it goes below uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, natural rate of interest, <clears throat> then what happens? And so he sets in motion, again, in Wixell, this process uh, was done by an actual difference between between the bank rate and this barter exchange uh, natural rate. 
But as Mises points out, since money is integrated into the economy, when the bank rate goes down, the rate of exchange or interest, I should say, um, in production also goes down. Well, he, you know, I noticed that Mises takes a lot of pains to talk about what interest is not. He, he insists, first of all, it's not rent. If you recall, he has a sort of a, a pretty lengthy few pages about how it's not rent and it's not right. return on capital. And, and in the context of this lengthy few pages, uh, what, what I really liked was, was he sort of debunks this whole um, triumvirate of, of labor, capital, land. We tend to look at things uh, as one of these three categories. And Mises takes pains to say this is very unhelpful. That's exactly right. He gets this, uh, again, from uh, Fetter, uh, or at least Fetter was the one who pioneered this uh, view. And uh, again, what Fetter was working against was uh, th- this position that had come out of the classical school and even was sort of lingering in Turgot that there's something uh, especially uh, productive about uh, capital or for to go about land or, you know, one of the factors of production, that there's some distinction uh, with respect to the rate of return that can be earned by investing in these uh, different types of factors of production. And what Feder pointed out is that this is entirely wrong, that the process of capitalization, the process that the investor goes through in calculating the present value of the future revenue stream by investing in a durable uh, producer good, uh, is the same whether the uh, durable producer good is land or capital good or uh, you know any other factor of production. So, uh, so there's a commonality, there's a universal law of, of pricing with respect to uh, all of these factors of production. And that's what Mises is emphasizing. Yeah, it's a great uh, section of the book. Well, and again, in this discussion of originary interest, he points out land. If we didn't discount all of its future uses, we we might find people didn't really buy and sell land. Yeah, that's correct. They they would just hold it. Yeah, because the price would be indefinitely high. You would have, you, you, you would, you have land that's been in useful production for thousands of years. And if you tried to, uh, you know, just add up the monetary return, uh, you know, a thousand years into the future from land that uh, can grow a crop every year, you you get uh, indefinitely high prices for land, and then land could never be bought and sold. Well, what in the Misesian conception of originary interest, and I hope I'm saying this right, uh, Mises argues that this the, the the number the interest rate is always positive. And of course, today, that's very much in dispute, uh, uh, let's say, across Europe, uh, not, not necessarily nominally, but there are uh, so- there is sovereign debt from certain European countries that trades and sells with a real negative uh, re- return on it. And there's people, we'll get to this, but there's people like Eamon Butler. I'm sure a lot of you will, will know that name, an economist with the Adam Smith Institute who would argue that, that interest can be zero or even negative. So, so first and foremost, and those of us who are lay, lay readers like myself and like most of our listeners, the idea of zero or negative interest rate is just crazy on its face. You'd never give up something today uh, in exchange for something less tomorrow. Um, so help us with the Misesian... Uh, argument that the, the interest rates are always positive. Right. J- just to comment, though, on, on what you just said about the common sense view of this, this was also the position that was advanced by Irving Fisher. He, he was, uh, as far as I know, the first one to point this out, that uh, the nominal interest rate, the, the actual exchange of present money for future money, the, uh, the intertemporal exchange rate, uh, could never be negative. Because as you uh, point out, uh, the lender, if it were negative, the lender would simply hold on to the cash and uh, would not lend and then would have the full sum at the end of the uh, end of the period. Uh, and that's always better than having the, the smaller sum where you would have to you know, have a negative uh, interest rate on the on the uh, principal. So so that's the uh, you know, that's in the literature, a very powerful argument. But Mises's view, again, uh, goes back to the human condition. Where, where he points out that time preference itself can never be, uh, so to speak, negative. There always must be a preference for sooner uh, satisfaction of an end compared to the same satisfaction later, that this is just built into human nature. And if originary interest then is just a manifestation of time preference, as uh, Mises argues, well, then the originary interest can never be negative. 
Right. And let's, well, let's talk a little bit more about this. Now, and, and in the future, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do a show more on the actual mechanics of central bank money creation and central bank interest rate targeting. Maybe we won't use the term setting. So this discussion is more about interest rate theory. So I want to, again, make that point. But uh, let's, say, let's say interest rates were zero, not even negative, but zero on just something like my Vanguard money market. I would be sorely tempted to say even with any counterparty other than cash in my house and then I've got a burglary risk, but with any counterparty, even a CD or a money market or a local uh, savings and loan bank, I've always got a risk of them going under or closing their doors or having a seizure or something. So why would I ever even deposit money, much less lend it at zero interest rates? Now, if I let's say I had 50 grand in my Vanguard. Um, I might at zero interest rates, I might take the risk of storing that in my house. Uh, now, if I had a million dollars in my Vanguard, I might say I, I'm not comfortable with a million dollars in my house, and so I'll pay I'll pay a couple points for some sort of safeguarding, uh, basically warehousing elect- electronic blips at Vanguard or or whatever at a bank. But 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 apart from that burglary risk or or whatever, why would I ever why would I just hold on to my cash in, in, in the most literal physical sense? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Or, or you would take the cash and buy consumer goods yeah. and enjoy the uh, subjective value of the consumer goods. Yeah, that's exactly. I might just say, well, you know, I'll, I, I get a car or, or put it into something tangible. Uh, I might buy gold and silver. I might buy all kinds of things or I might just go to Vegas. Um, but it, uh, I'm not earning any any interest on my money. Now, now let's let's take that into the negative interest rate territory, where, which we've we've actually seen in Europe. May, I mean, is there an argument that a big institutional investor, let's say a a pension fund, a university, somebody hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, or, or euro or, or Swiss francs or whatever, says, "Well, look, these sovereign sovereign debt." Uh, whether that be U.S. Treasuries or uh, uh, you know German bonds or not, not Greek and Italian bonds, by the way, but German bonds, uh, uh, you know those are those are the next thing, the next best thing to actual cash. I mean, those are the the default risk on those approaches zero because these are sovereign governments that can produce. Well, the ECB can produce euro, um, and so we'll pay a few points in the form of 3% negative real interest, just to know that that's the extent of our loss. It's almost like it's almost like in a pure uh, 100% reserve bank, I might pay a few points for, in effect, a warehousing function. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's, uh, that's correct. And um, uh, just on the uh, other uh, aspect of this, when governments, uh, central banks institute uh, negative interest rates with respect to the banking system, then then this, of course, is not an interest rate at all, but just a fee. Yeah, it, right. It, it's a fee. And, and, and of course, the other thing is we, we kid ourselves, I think most, most of our listeners would, would agree about the real rate of inflation. Right. So uh, you know, who knows what's a, a real negative yield? Even you know if you're getting a point and a half on your uh, savings account or whatever. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean that might be real negative at the moment, right here in the in the in the good old U.S. of A. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so so this is this is interesting to me, but but there's another argument out there, and Eamon Butler makes this argument. So we'll play devil's advocate. It says, well, look, uh, the the days of of high interest rates are gone forever because we no longer need uh, to pay that much. To, to get capitalists to do things because we've gotten really good at capitalism. We've gotten really good at producing stuff cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as productivity increased throughout the 20th century, now 21st. So as a result of that, um, we're better at producing stuff. And, and, and on top of all that, not only are we in the West better, but now we have places like India and China and Vietnam that can, that can make stuff too. So, you know, you put all this together and we've got an overall deflationary environment for stuff and therefore uh, investors are willing to accept lower rates because falling prices boost, you know, their real returns. And so even a nominal a nominal rate of zero uh, is, is a real positive interest rate when we view things this way, when we don't talk about when we talk about deflation, the deflationary pressures of a productive global economy, especially, you know, look at something, Jeff, like like consumer electronics. So I think the uh, I think the point here, of course, is that 
<clears throat> the is is to go back to this capitalization idea. If entrepreneurs anticipate uh, lower selling prices in the future, they're in a market like uh, consumer electronics where they see the price uh, trend going down. Then, then of course, they, that affects their demand for the factors of production now and the price of the assets that they're holding uh, in, uh, to engage in this production because the future revenue stream now is altered. And uh, whether or not they, or to the extent that they discount this future revenue stream, um, is 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 based upon a different, entirely different consideration, as, as Misa says. And this this consideration is just the, uh, so to speak, social rate of time preference, the, the the underlying rate of time preference that's moving people uh, to uh, to uh, save and invest. So, but doesn't that imply that interest rates would adjust positive? Uh, in, in other words, wouldn't they factor in, for instance, or or, or they they uh, capitalist entrepreneurs uh, would would factor this into their wages going forward? Yeah. The wages they pay, wages and and prices for capital goods, mainly prices for capital goods. This this whole uh, deflationary push in consumer electronics is driven by falling prices for the intermediate capital goods, and 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 not so much wages. But you're right, the price structure. Uh, the, the production price structure is going down. So I wonder if it's really deflation and productivity and, and technology has a lot to do with that. You know, technology is what makes a cell phone so much better than a, a, a desktop computer 25 years ago. Uh, I wonder if, if, the, if the idea that we all feel kind of materially well off in the West is really just a result of, of technology and and productivity and deflation outpacing the rapaciousness of governments and central banks. So it's it's not it's not be, you know pe- because people want to say look you libertarians if you guys were right about all these regulations and all these taxes and all this central bank intervention we'd be getting poorer. But we're not. Look at this. I just got this incredible you know cell phone for 400 bucks. Yeah, well we need to recognize here in addition to what you have already said that um the they're different. They're freer and less free uh, sectors in the economy, and of course, the government uh, doesn't heavily regulate or subsidize the consumer electronics, and so this is a freer part of the economy. And naturally, this attracts even more investment than uh, would be otherwise. And if you look at areas of the economy that are heavily regulated, healthcare and uh, so on, you see prices going up and up and up, and uh, quality going down and down and down. Yeah, isn't that amazing? We look at healthcare and education. Right. <laughs> the two right. areas the two. where government and, and of course it wasn't that long ago, even ten or fifteen years ago, we considered Silicon Valley was the Wild West. <laughs> and it was the consider you know, soft the w- one thing the United States is good at is software. And we have we've in many ways led the world and uh, we, we always had this sort of cowboy view of venture capital operating in Silicon Valley and that there were these fortunes to be made. And, and even co- big companies like Microsoft used to almost sort of pride themselves on not having a lobbying presence in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C., mm-hmm. that they were o- operating a- outside of that. And of course, now, uh, yeah, Facebook and Google and Microsoft have some lobbyists, let's yeah, just I'm, say. Yeah. Unfortunately, times are a changing. Yeah, but but really, um, you know, interest rates would. In other words, I guess the point I'm trying to get at here is that deflation alone doesn't create an argument for zero or negative interest rates. No, that's correct. It does not, because precisely because entrepreneurs are always and investors are always forward looking, and so if they see the trend of output prices falling, they they lower their demands right now for. Uh, uh, the factors of production, especially capital. The, and, and therefore, the whole price structure goes down without any difference in the price spread between output prices and input prices. Well, I'll leave you, Jeff, with this question. Let's say some of our listeners, I hope some of our listeners will go check out Bomberwerk. Uh, we will link not only to the Trigo article I mentioned by Murray Rothbard, but we'll also link to a great sort of summary biography of uh, uh, Bomberwerk written by Roger Garrison, and you'll really enjoy it and you'll learn a lot from it. Uh, but it, you know, if, if one of our listeners wanted to maybe grasp interest rates better than they grasp them now, what would be a, a, a recommended book or article that you might think of to help them with that that wouldn't require a treatise-length uh, reading uh, assignment? 
Mm -hmm. Right. The the great work is uh, Rothbard's uh, edited volume of Frank Fetter's articles, uh, Capital Interest in Rent. Okay. And and we, we've got that available at BC.org. But, you know, the other thing that we haven't touched on, uh, Jeff, is that there's an ethical component to all of this. Uh, obviously, Guido Halsman has his great book, The Ethics of Money Production. Interest plays a role in all this. In other words, it's not just that interest rates, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, are some technical uh, policy tool that regulators or technocrats or central bankers use to adjust up and down, and the economy is kind of like the the uh, you know the space heater in your office or something. It's too hot or too cool. But but instead, I mean, there isn't. There's a component to all of this that goes back to time, not only to our, our our interest in things now rather than later, but also in saving for a rainy day, for recognizing we're hopefully going to get old someday, and and maybe even more hopefully that we might have children or grandchildren who live on. And when you when you when you would interfere with this process, when you interfere with interest rates, there's an ethical and cultural component to that, not just not just financial or economic. That's absolutely true. Uh, it breaks the, uh, the natural intergenerational associations and families. It, uh, it stifles uh, the creativity of uh, people who are uh, you know, more inclined to, to that sort of uh, activity because of the dearth of, uh, uh, of investing uh, uh, funds and and so on. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Guido's uh, work is uh, great in this respect. Well, again, it's Guido Holzman, The Ethics of Money Production, a magnificent slim volume. And if you're not following me on Twitter, at Jeff Deist, follow me, send me a message, and I might just send you a copy of that book for free because you'll, you'll really enjoy it. It's not your, your typical economics text. Uh, that said, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner at Grove City, uh, thanks so much. This was really a great conversation. Help me, and I'm sure it'll help our listeners. Well, thank you, Jeff. All right. Take care. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.